Welcome to the Tobacco Online Policy Seminar Tops. Thank you for joining us today. I'm Si Shang from the Ohio State University. Tops is organized by Justin White from University of California, San Francisco, Catherine McLean from George Mason University, Mike Pasco from Georgia State University, and me. The seminar will be one hour with questions from the moderator and discussant. The audience may pose questions and comments in the Q&A panel, and the moderator will draw from these questions and comments in conversation with the presenter. Please review the guidelines on tobaccopolicy.org for acceptable comments. Please keep the comments professional and related to the research being discussed. Comments that meet the seminar series guidelines will be shared with the presenter afterwards, even if they are now read aloud. Your comments are very much appreciated. This presentation is being video recorded and will be made available, along with presentation slides on the TOPS website, tobaccopolicy.org. I will turn the presentation over to today's moderator, Justin White from University of California, San Francisco, to introduce our speaker. Today, we continue our fall 2022 season with a Grand Rounds presentation by Andrew Barnes entitled, Informing Tobacco Policy Through Laboratory and Field Experiments. This presentation was selected by a competitive review process by submission through the TOPS website. Andrew Barnes, PhD, is a professor of health, health behavior and policy at Virginia Commonwealth University, or VCU, uh, research associate in cancer prevention and control at Massey Cancer Center, and affiliate faculty in the Center for the Study of Tobacco Products, uh, Center on Society and Health, and Center on Health Disparities. His research interests include substance use policy, tobacco regulatory science, and behavioral economics. He's the, the co-author of Healthcare Systems in Transition, United States of America, and the forthcoming Economics of Health Reconsidered, the fifth edition, and co-editor of Behavioral Economics and Healthy Behaviors, Key Concepts, and Current Research. He completed his doctoral training in health policy with a concentration in economics at the, uh, uh, the University of California, Los Angeles, holds a master's of public health with Tulane University and a bachelor's of arts in psychology and biology from Pitts, uh, Pitzer College. Dr. Caroline Cobb, an associate professor at VCU is a co-author of the studies and will answer select questions in the Q&A. Our discussant today is Dr. Tracy Smith, a tobacco researcher at the Medical University of South Carolina. Dr. Andrew Barnes, thank you for presenting for us today. Thanks a lot, Justin and TOPS folks. Um, can you guys see my slides okay? Yes, it looks yes. good. All right, the hardest part of the talk is over for me. Um, all right, so uh, you'll see a lot of mur murals in this uh, presentation. These are murals from our city here in Richmond, and it's mostly just for me to give me like energy as I keep going uh, and to see that the city that I love and I live in and work in. Um, so acknowledgments, uh, Caroline, of course, first and foremost, she's uh, she's driving the chat and the Q and A. Uh, our colleagues, co-authors, um, our staff, our students and our participants. Uh, work is funded by CTP of FDA and, and NIDA, as well uh, through various mechanisms, as well as our cancer center. Um, I have no conflicts to report. Um, a health equity disclosure, Carol and I, Caroline and I have been doing this uh, for a little while now. Um, we are, so you know who we are and to center our work. We are white, affluent, cisgender, uh, straight researchers. We don't intend to be health equity tourists. We're here for the long run. Uh, we're committed to improving the health of groups who are disproportionately affected by tobacco product use. A lot of our work now is increasingly with racialized populations and black uh, uh, individuals who smoke menthol cigarettes, LGBTQ plus populations. So um, we, we've been doing this for a little while. We're going to keep doing this work. Um, and so, yeah, so we've been working together uh, for a while now, um, at least seven years. And we have got a lot of studies that I'm excited to share with you today. Um, so. So this is the uh, quintessential right econ slide in case you have to leave early. Uh, uh, you know, economic models of demand for tobacco products are play a pivotal role in assessing the efficacy of price and non-price policy. Um, most of these approaches have historically and continue to rely on uh, sort of secondary consumer and policy data. And that's a little bit challenging because a lot of what we want to do is, is sort of predict policy effects or likely policy effects sort of ex ante. Um, and that's where a lot of this work that we're going to talk about today comes in, sort of using laboratories as to, to conduct policy experiments. 
relevant to regulatory science. Um, so some backgrounds. Uh, I first want to acknowledge uh, Bob Kastner. So uh, many of you know Bob. Uh, I gave a talk. I was a, a labor econ guy in, in, in uh, my graduate training, looking at sort of the, the labor market returns to alcohol use. And um, I came in here doing some of that. I was starting to look at sort of twin studies and looking at sort of, uh, you know, um, fraternal versus identical twins and using twin fixed effects models. And I presented some of this data in 2013 at a small econ conference. And Bob was my discussant. He was like, you know what? This isn't going to go anywhere. Do something else. And it was really hard to take at the time, but it really pushed me into marrying behavioral economics that I had been doing in my graduate training as well with sort of substance use uh, policy research. So it, it sort of forced me to marry those two things. And then I met Caroline and we were off to the races. Um, so. Um, so I'm gonna talk a lot about abuse liability. Well, what is that? So it refers to the likelihood that products will be used persistently despite consequences. This kind of comes from Carter, a paper by Carter, sort of foundational back in 2009. And so you've got these two pieces, likelihood of use and consequences. And so there's this construct, the sort of meta construct of abuse liability and these sort of sub constructs, right? These other little bubbles. And you can think about sort of pharmacokinetic effects, uh, uh, um, you know, CNS effects, reinforcing effects, um, dependence, and so on. A lot of our work sort of focuses on that reinforcing effects bubble, particularly thinking about self-administration, right? How are people, is someone look, thinking about methods of self-administration of a drug to assess its abuse potential? And so the FDA wants to know about how regulatory targets can influence abuse liability. So this is really important to FDA and the work that we do for FDA. And some of those targets that we've, we've been looking at in the lab, those regulatory targets include nicotine delivery, ENDS flavors, you know, menthol in cigarettes, HTP, so on and so forth. Product, product design, so device power and wattage uh, of, of an ENDS device and um, so on and so forth, you know, messaging and, and the like. So we're gonna really focus on this sort of reinforcing effects bubble and look at sort of simulated self-administration procedures and choice procedures that are gonna be reinforced to participants. Um, uh, what are some of the methods that we use? So this is, I'm actually in this building right now in our lab, our behavioral health research laboratory. Uh, the student in the lab coat is no longer a student, she's at FDA. Uh, was Marjana, and the student in the pink shirt is the participant is now at Yale um, doing a postdoc, Sarah. So um, we have a lab and we have actually participants in our lab right now for our clinical trial uh, next door to me. And uh, so they are hooked up to uh, you know blood pressure, heart rate monitor. They may have a catheter in their arm to do blood draws, we like to look at sort of nicotine delivery, right? Um, as they're puffing on um, uh, products. Uh, we have a computer for them to answer sort of some of our choice procedures and, and behavioral economic tasks I'll be talking about. Um, we have, uh, a, we can measure their puff topography. So you can see Sarah in the pink shirt's holding an ENDS device. It's actually hooked up to another machine that can measure how quickly she's drawing from that device and how long she's drawing from it to get the sort of topography of her puffing behavior. We can also measure their CO, her CO, uh, maybe we can collect urine from her or saliva for other, um, you know, uh, biomarkers, right? Um, so, and, and sort of the stars are some of the various places where we can get at measures of abuse liability, right? Um, we also, outside the lab, measure, have, conduct naturalistic assessments of tobacco use. So right now in our clinical trial, I'll talk about it later, but we're using EMA to look at real time, sort of like how are people using products um, that we're giving them. Um, you can think about abuse liability in sort of a broader context in a reinforcer pathology model of drug abuse. This is sort of Warren Bickle's sort of model. And why this is important is it sort of marries sort of abuse liability or valuation of, of drugs of abuse with something economists have been thinking about for a long time, as well as psychologists, which is sort of discount rates, right? So it's sort of like the, the most risky person is someone who has a high valuation for a substance and has a, a really high discount rate, right? So, and we'll be talking a little bit about correlations between those two things that we've observed in, in some of our work. All right, so what are behavioral economic assessments of abuse liability? Where this is not the kind of behavioral economics I learned about in my, my dissertation, right? This is not like nudge, you know, Dick Thaler, Cass Sunstein stuff, right? Um, this is sort of 
behavioral psychology that's incorporating concepts from neoclassical economics in a framework of abuse liability. Those concepts are demand, right? So own price, cross price, elasticity. All right. So we'll be talking more about that. So it's it took it, you know, it took a little bit of time for me to sort of reconcile some of some of these different uh, ways in which we use the term behavioral economics in psychology in 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 sort of health psychology versus how economists and other psychologists might think of behavioral economics right so just take away these aren't nudges um all right so what can we do with these behavioral economic methods to assess tobacco product abuse liability well first we can predict we can predict policy impact in a heterogeneous and evolving market, right? So we have a study right now that's using Juul and Juul came off the market for, or was about to come off the market for a little bit, right? We have a study where we're doing, we're using ICOS and FTC like, you know, said, you know, uh, PMI can't sell ICOS anymore. So this is a rapidly, as you all know, evolving market. So being able to sort of be nimble and quick um, and, and look at some, uh, predict some uh, potential policy effects uh, upfront is very helpful. Um, so we can also forecast some unintended consequences of uh, policy and look at interactions of multiple policies uh, or potential policies and also integrate and incorporate and contextualize clinical survey and economic data into some of the data that we're, we're um, collecting here in the lab and in the field. Um, these tasks help us determine how much a participant values a tobacco product, um, how hard they're willing to work to obtain a product. Um, and I'll talk about each of these in a minute, as well as the relative strength of preferences, substitution, and the likelihood of poly use of competing products. So what are some of these the, the sort of tasks that we use in the lab and in the field? Um, some of these can only really be done in the lab, but um, the first one I'll talk about uh, today is the multiple choice procedure. Um, and all the ones with asterisks are actually reinforced. That means like the decisions people make, they get money or drugs and drugs, you know, tobacco products, what have you, um, and to use. Um, we have hypothetical purchase tasks that I'll talk about. Progressive ratio tasks, very similar to the, you know, rat pressing the button to get the, the drink of the, you know, the drink with the cocaine in it. In this case, it's people pushing buttons to get puffs. Um, and uh, we have experimental tobacco marketplaces, which can be reinforced as well, which I think uh, maybe folks have come to talk to you about before. Uh, and then we also have some uh, ways in our lab or assessing what, what I call economic preferences, uh, which probably many of you call economic preferences. Um, uh, delay discounting tasks, so the minute discounting task, and then the, the for risk taking, um, the balloon analog risk task, we're, we're administering that as well. Um, so the first of these tasks is the multiple choice procedure. It's very straightforward. You're offering people a choice. Uh, you're giving them a price schedule and you're offering them a choice at each price. Would you rather have 10 puffs of this product, for example, or the money? And they, they uh, make their choices at each, uh, you know, each option, uh, puffs or money. And then at some point, uh, you know, people typically switch over to, to preferring money over puffs. Uh, and, and then one of these choices is drawn at random and reinforced. They get money or they get puffs and they have a, if they get puffs, they have time to, to, uh, to consume those puffs in our lab. Um, so that's the first one. Um, the next one is a hypothetical purchase task. So here you're, uh, you have a, a price schedule again, you're asking people how much they would, how much of a, a given tobacco product they would demand at each of the following prices. Um, and so um, in this case, it's like, you know, uh, 10 puffs of your own brand e-cigarette, you know, so um, if 10 puffs of your own brand e-cigarette cost, you know, a dollar, how many puffs would you buy? Uh, and you're buying these puffs to consume in a day. Um, and so we've done this a, a whole lot uh, with various products, cigarettes and cigars. I'll talk about that a little bit. Um, but again, this is a hypothetical task where the, the prior one was uh, sort of a reinforced uh, a sort of a revealed preferences task. Some of the outcomes you can get um, from the purchase task is is sort of you know how how much will people consume when when the product is free or buy when the product is free, which from an economist standpoint is sort of a weird thing to think about. But it turns out in the behavioral lab, sort of this intensity measure, how much will people use and they have free access to it, unlimited free access to it, 
is incredibly important uh, and, and correlates with things like dependence and uh, other sort of measures of addiction and abuse liability that we've been looking at. So uh, break point, which is sort of, you know, the, the maximum you're willing to pay for, for a product. And then the, the right-hand side uh, outcomes I won't talk about today very much. And, and there's a typo too, that should be log spending and the y-axis, but it's really a sense of like how much are people spending in total on that product and what's the price of that at that highest spending. Um, and I guess I should go back and say in that, that multiple choice procedure back here, the, the main outcome here is that price at which people switch over from wanting puffs to money, right? So that, that sort of crossover point is the outcome. Whereas um, here it's sort of similar, like the break point is, is another important outcome, that price in which people, uh, is the, after that price, people demand zero of the product, right? So consumption is suppressed to zero, like their willingness to pay in a way. Right, that would be our, our sort of analogy. Um, and then from these hypothetical purchase tasks, you can generate demand curves, right? So you have a price schedule and you have a free floating demand uh, for, uh, um, response. So here are some demand curves we can generate. Um, and, you know, right, so the darker the red line, the, the more inelastic someone is for the drug or the tobacco product. Um, then you can also, um, instead of just having one product, you can have two products people are demanding at the same time, right? You can fix the price of let's say uh, cigarettes and you can increase the price of ends. And you can ask them at each ends price where they rather have how much ends would they buy and how much cigarettes would they buy, right? Um, when cigarette prices are fixed, right? So you're escalating the ends price. At what point are people you know, substituting over? What's the cross price elasticity of cigarettes? as you increase ends or start taxing ends, right? And I'll talk about that some more later. Um, and of course, if they're, you know, substitutes, you'd see sort of the, the yellow line, right? And the, and the gray line. Um, and then if they're, you know, complements, then you'd sort of see this dashed line. Um, and then if they're independent, right? They'd be sort of the horizontal line. Um, and you can imagine some tobacco products are complements and some are, some are substitutes. And, and some maybe depends on the population. Um, so we'll talk more about that as well. The uh, progressive ratio task, uh, it's really cool. It's pretty much what you think it is. You're just hitting a space bar to, to earn puffs, right? You're working to earn puffs. Um, we've actually extended this to have a cross product ratio task, which I won't talk about today, but you can you can work for either, you know, e-cigarettes or cigarettes or menthol e-cigarettes or, you know, tobacco e-cigarettes. And so here the outcome is sort of how many puffs did you earn? And how many times did you press the bar? Those are some two of the outcomes. There's there's more, but those are sort of two that we focus on, all right? Um, and um, so those are sort of the main uh, tools that we've been using right now. I'll talk about some more a little bit later. Um, and I'm gonna transition now into sort of how are we using those tools, applying them, all right? So um, the first is sort of the first two studies that Carolyn and I ever got funded. They're both sort of like these two by two studies. So these are each separate studies. They're, own, they're cigarette smokers and, and they sort of, the cross is the, the ends flavor and whether or not it has a reduced harm or, or, uh, or reduced exposure, sort of MRTP, FDA MRTP message with the ends and the ends condition. So we had, you know, um, working age adults who were smokers um, uh, come in. Uh, they had, they were not regular ends users. Um, we had an own brand cigarette condition and they had these other four conditions that were uh, randomly ordered according to like a Latin square design. And they came in abstinent, 12 hours abstinent in each session, right? Um, and so, so we administered these, these, this multiple choice procedure task. Again, that's the reinforced task, puffs or money. Um, and also this hypothetical task. So that the top row is the, the multiple choice procedure, procedure crossover point, those top two graphs. Um, and that's the sort of like analogous of like the willingness to pay, right, for, for uh, the product. Uh, and the bottom two graphs are the, their price sensitivity or the sort of the, the elasticity or the rate of change in their elasticity on that demand curve. So we generated a demand curve for each individual. And then we sort of look at the average of the, you know, alphas or elasticities across all the demand curves. And so, um, and I also want to call your attention to like the top two slides, the higher the number, the higher the abuse liability, right? The bottom two slides, the bottom two graphs, uh, the, the, um, the lower the number, the higher the abuse liability, right? Because the more price insensitive you are, 
the higher your abuse potential is, right? The more sticky you are to a price, um, the, the higher the abuse potential. So what do we find? So the, the, the left-hand side is, is uh, tobacco and menthol ends and then the, their own brands, their own brands of black. And you can see there's not a lot of variation in, in sort of their willingness to pay for these products. But you look at their, their uh, price sensitivity, you can see that these smokers were a little more price sensitive for uh, menthol ends than tobacco ends, particularly when there was no message involved. But when there was a reduced um, you know, exposure message with the menthol ends, that price sensitivity decreased. Right, so messages seem to matter even within a given flavor condition. On the right hand side, you can see um, people generally didn't like unflavored ends. I can tell you I tried them, they don't taste very good. Um, uh, back in the day, the ones we use now are much better, but back then they didn't taste great. Um, so, uh, you know, you can see that their uh, the abuse liability, the crossover points much lower than even cherry or their own brand cigarettes. Um, um, and then also, it's even worse when you, you pair it with a, re, a reduced exposure message. And so there might be some sort of uh, unintended consequences or effects of, of sort of messaging um, uh, with, uh, with that as well. Um, so, um, you know, both flavors and messages are potentially important policy levers and the interaction of the two can have a powerful influence on abuse land, right? Um, so, and, uh, you know, it is helpful to look, think about some of these um, economic measures of demand in the lab, sort of triangulating through using different tools. And we're gonna talk about that some more as well. Um, and uh, so we also have looked at the, these kind of, um, looked at flavors for cigars, right? So this is an RO3 that we had, um, and it was with young adult uh, cigarette smokers. These are cigarette smokers who are relatively cigar naive. And, um, and this is work that right now is really relevant to the FDA's um, you know, proposed product standards for cigars, right? Um, so uh, 25 you know, uh, young adults came in, uh, and they had five lab visits, they had an own brand cigarette, and then four of sort of the most popular black and mild cigar flavors, each one each session. Um, we chose black and mild because it's sort of like, you know, one of the most popular cigar brands, and we sort of chose some of the most popular flavors of that brand. All right. And, uh, you know, we're, we're, we're going to, we collect saliva, um, carbon monoxide, we're using puff topography, so we're connecting their cigarette or their cigar to a machine that measures how fast and how long and how much they're puffing during directed bouts. We're gonna you know, say 10, take 10 puffs of this thing and we're gonna record their puffing. Um, and then these behavioral economic measures as well. And so what do we see? So we've got several different uh, types of outcomes here. So the first one is behavioral economic demand. Again, this is that sort of MCP crossover point or they're like, willingness to the most they're willing to pay for for the product before they want to they prefer to take money right um and so you can see here that like the uh the original and cream flavored black and mild cigars are pretty close to the own brand cigarette sort of in the in the amount they're willing to pay for for that product and 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 the wine and apple cigars uh, flavors are much lower right they, they're significantly lower um in terms of like sort of the I'm going to go now to the one below that user behavior. You can see that like what's happening here is that people are taking significantly longer puffs of the cigar than, than the own brand cigarette. Potentially that could be because they're flavored, right? Maybe it's easier for that poison to go down. Um, uh, so, uh, but when you look at the drug delivery, I'm now up in the, the, the top right corner, you can see that uh, this is sort of saliva nicotine. So we took their saliva after directed bouts. So they used 10 puffs of their own brand cigarette, you know, and then the next lab session, they used 10 puffs of an original cigar. We take their saliva, we measure nicotine in the saliva, and you can see the amount of nicotine they're getting is much lower for all these sort of cigar, um, uh, cigar products relative to their own brand cigarette. And then if you look at sort of um, flavor um, uh, intensity, you can see that sort of the uh, you know original cigar is probably the the lowest flavor intensity, and these other you know flavored cigars are much higher. So what does that mean? You know, for if you know flavors don't seem to be contributing much to the abuse liability of of these cigars, you know, particularly these like wine flavor, apple flavor, you know, cigars, um, 
they don't seem to be uh, influencing the puff duration, how much people are puffing, or um, how much nicotine is being delivered to them. So, you know, maybe we don't need them, right? Um, and so, uh, you know, they, uh, so this is these papers. So one of the papers is out, and there's a second one that that uh, should be coming out soon that has the, this sort of puff topography data in it, the saliva nicotine data in it, and and others. Um, but it's a really neat example of how we can sort of pair behavioral economic assessments in the lab with you know biomarkers of nicotine delivery with user behavior. Um, so, and then I'm going to talk about um, some other stuff that we're doing now with ends. So looking at sort of varying uh, nicotine concentration and device power, all right? So, so these two things together. So as you probably know, in 2014, the EU's tobacco product directive regulations limited uh, ends liquid nicotine concentration to 20 mg per mil, right? Presumably to reduce the abuse potential of these products, right? However, um, you know, this reduction in, in nicotine concentration can be offset potentially by jacking up the power of the device, right? You increase the wattage, right? And you're gonna maybe get more, uh, enable it to enable the user sort of do a, an end run around that policy, right? So uh, of course these have to be sort of um, tank-like devices or user modifiable devices, not like a closed system, like a jewel, right? This has to be a, like a tank device where people can dial up or down the wattage. Um, so that's what we looked at. And then we also looked at, at the same time um, what were some of the roles of, of individual economic preferences? So we've got um, 19 people who were ex who exclusively used ENDS, 17 people who were dual users, um, and there was uh, five conditions like their own brand ENDS, um, and then uh, you know these you know a low high watt, low high nic uh, um, uh, device, right? So we crossed nicotine and power, right, in the study. And then we also uh, did, you know, looked at risk taking and delayed discounting at baseline. And so, when you de these outcomes are from the progressive ratio task. So this is really how hard are people willing to work to earn a puff of this product? All right. So you can see here that like the um, you know people were much uh, willing to work much harder, both dual and exclusive end users for the high nick low watt device. So what that means is that like, you know, you can, it's sort of what we were thinking might happen is that, you know, you can have a, um, a sort of, uh, you know, you can alter wattage matters, right? So you can, you can sort of um, get around, um, you know, nicotine limits and uh, by increasing the wattage um, of, the, of the device. And we also find that like, you know, risk taking was associated with higher abuse liability um, but lower dependence. And, uh, you know, discount rates were associated with higher abuse liability um, and um, among and in, among dual users specifically, lower discount rates were associated with higher cigarette dependence. So again, sort of getting back to um, that reinforcer pathology model of like thinking about valuation and, and um, discount rates as potentially being very important for targeting populations that might have the hardest time, um, you know, quitting or, or substituting away from a product. Um, so, you know, um, yeah, particularly like, you know, open system, it's really challenging. Mean, the takeaway here is it's really challenging to regulate ends if you allow open systems, because there's so many different components that can change the delivery profile of nicotine, right? as well as the toxicants that are emitted from, from an ENDS. So um, open systems make it very difficult to regulate. Um, and then the last thing I'm gonna talk about before we take a sort of a, a pause and have some discussion is an extension of this. It's not a study we've got going on right now that looks at nicotine flux. It's the rate of emission of nicotine from the device. And if you, um, and if you can, limit the duration of the device. So, you know, like a, a jewel, for example, if you puff on it for a little bit, uh, it'll time out, right? Um, so you, if, you, if you add a puff duration limiter onto a device and you control the flux of the device, then you can control the dose of nicotine that's delivered from the mouth end of the device to the user. So that's what we're gonna do. 
Um, so we look at sort of a, a, um, four ends conditions. One is a no flux condition, means there's no nicotine in it at all. Um, a one is a low flux condition, one that's a cigarette-like flux condition. So we have these mathematical models that we can predict what a cigarette-like flux is for an e-cigarette and then build that sort of um, profile into an e-cigarette. And then we have a higher than cigarette-like flux condition, right? So sort of to think about like, if we were to design the optimal e-cigarette to help cigarette smokers switch, does it need to have a nicotine delivery you know, like a cigarette or not? That's sort of like the question. Um, and so we're recruiting, um, you know, uh, it's two different studies. Uh, one study is recruiting end users who may also smoke. And then another study is uh, recruiting mostly smokers, cigarette smokers. And the left panel is blood data. So this is blood data um, uh, after, uh, um, you know, 10 puffs. Um, so people come in abstinent, they are in one of these conditions, they have 10 puffs of their cigarette or the, one of these flux conditions. And you can see what you would expect. The higher flux um, um, devices are delivering more nicotine to the blood. Um, and then that dash line is sort of what a cigarette is like. Um, and then on the left-hand panel, uh, at the top is sort of users or participants ratings of harshness. And you can see that the, uh, the low flux condition is much less harsh than, harsh than the high flux condition. And below that is how many puffs people earned in these conditions. And you can see that people earned more puffs in the low flux and no flux conditions than in the cigarette like flux or higher flux conditions. So how do you put this all together? Um, so it's sort of like, first of all, it's important to note that you can control dose, right? By controlling flux and, 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 and puff duration, right? So that's, that's good to know. Um, and, you know, limiting nicotine dose helps prevent people who use ends from receiving more nicotine than is delivered by a combustible cigarette. That's also good. We probably don't want ends out there that are delivering more nicotine than a cigarette. So we could, we could help with that as well. But then, you know, ends with high nicotine flux appear to have lower abuse liability than cigarettes, in part because we saw, we observed people earn the fewest puffs. They also reported greater harshness and, and also a worse taste profile. Um, yet, like higher flux ends were more effective at suppressing nicotine cravings than no flux. So, you know, you while they may be effective at, at delivering, I mean, at reducing, you know, cravings, uh, you may not need a high flux ends out there to get people to to get people to switch. Maybe having a lower flux ends is sort of like the sweet spot where it's got enough nicotine delivery, but it's also not um, as dangerous in terms of like toxin emissions and harshness. So that was a whole lot I went through. I'm gonna stop for a minute and so we can have this, some discussions before we talk about sort of where we're heading right now with our body of work. Yeah, that's a, a, a lot of great information you presented. Um, to start off, I will uh, turn it to our discussant, Tracy Smith, to see if she has any uh, comments and questions for you. Thanks, Justin. So Andrew, that was awesome. I really enjoyed hearing about those studies kind of together and thinking about them um, as a whole. Um, I have a bunch of questions, but I'll try to just um, narrow in. So in your study, looking at the relationship between nicotine concentration and wattage, mm -hmm. um, you pointed out that the, the combination that appeared to have the most abuse liability was the high nicotine, low wattage devices. And, you know, that just makes me think of how the, the devices that are kind of have surged in popularity over the last couple of years are that combination. They're the high nicotine, low wattage devices like Juul and Puff Bar and whatever else. And so, you know, what your thoughts are, you know, on that in terms of why that combination is more appealing than a high wattage, low nicotine device. And also, whether you think that the formulation of nicotine in terms of whether or not it's salt-based or free-based might, might impact that abuse liability. Yeah, that's a great question, Tracy. So I will say that um, in that study that you're referring to, we use salts, okay. right? So uh, we, yeah, there was, it was protonated nicotine. Um, so yeah, and so the, you know, the, so Juul, right, has been so popular um, part because it is a high concentration, low watt device, as you said. Um, you know, the salts seem to really help with the, um, decrease the harshness, you know, in the throat hit, um, and maybe have some more, uh, and maybe help also with absorption. 
Um, so, you know, that having that nicotine in that benzoic acid, there's other salts you can put it in, but really seems to help you be able to tolerate a higher dose of nicotine. And but, so if you were to take the, that salt and put it in a high watt device, it's, I mean, we've tried it. And, and of course we've, it was in our study. It's incredibly harsh, right? So you really have to have that, that lower wattage device to, to sort of make it not so aversive to individuals. So um, yeah, the salts really helped, uh, you know, get low, be able to deliver a lot of nicotine from a low wattage device. Okay. That's interesting. It's interesting that, that it becomes so harsh if you use it in a higher wattage device. Going back to like the very first study that you presented where you had um, different flavors and messaging, it looked like at least on one measure that um, the messaging of reduced risk increased abuse liability when it was a menthol flavor, but may there was um, on one of the measures, but may have reduced abuse liability yeah. if it was the unflavored and whether or not you think that's real, that the messaging depends on the flavor or you think it's kind of an artifact and, and you wouldn't see it again. I don't think it's the, I don't, I don't think it's the flavor. I think what it is, is it's the, it's the salience. I think I call the salience, right? So it was like, it's, so first of all, there are two different messages. One's reduced harm and one's reduced exposure. Okay. And I think the one that, yeah, I think the one that was the reduced spo- exposure was the one where we're seeing this behave sort of weirdly. And I almost wonder if it's like telling people about this might have, car- is reducing your exposure to carcinogens makes people think, oh crap, wait a minute, there's carcinogens in this? Even if it's less carcinogens, right? So I don't know if it's something about the sale, making some of this more salient and somehow influencing behavior. It does tell me that we need to know a lot more about uh, MRTPs and messaging from like, you know, uh, FDA, you know, for FDA to regulate these effectively. Because I don't, I don't, we don't know a lot about how these modified risk messages that tobacco product companies can apply for influence behavior. Yeah, I think that's, that's a great point. Um, we don't know enough about what the the impact would be on actual use behavior. We kind of assume, we think we would know what the, and I'll ask one more question. I know that we probably, we have a lot more to get to, but in thinking about flux, I had, you know, um, it's so interesting trying to wrap my head around those results where it looked like the highest flux condition wasn't even reaching your cigarette level bar that was for nicotine delivery that you had there, the horizontal line. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. It seemed to be too harsh and, you know, seemed to have lower abuse liability. And so when they are thinking about regulating flux, do you think the, the goal should be to keep it from going above the level of an, of a cigarette, even though it seems like people are kind of titrating that on their own and they don't like it when it goes too high. What are your thoughts about the target of flux and what the goal should be? Yeah, so this is great. So we, you know, at the high flux condition is a lot like what we we're talking about with the the high watt, high high salt nick, right? Okay. So it's yeah. that's what it is, right? So it's really aversive. So it's really good at delivering a lot of nicotine to you, but it, and people might be able to get, you know, um, you know, these weren't flavored either; they were all unflavored. Uh, so you okay. could sweeten yeah. that, you could put some menthol in that, and maybe make it a lot less aversive, right? Yeah. But um, no, I think it's an important point I didn't make is that they are, they're all unflavored. Um, so, and that's, we're really interested in, I know the FDA is very interested in this as well. We had a lot of conversations with them about like, is flux a good regulatory target? And, um, you know, you, maybe, but you'd have to have a closed system in. Mm-hmm. You couldn't do it. Like, you know, or it's only useful. Mess you know. up there, make their own flux and change it. Modify. Yeah, and, and I, th- I were thinking about this in part in terms of like, what if there was a pharmaceutical device that was a cessation device, that in cessation device, you would want that to be pretty tightly controlled. And you'd want the dose of that to be pretty regulated. Flux with a puff limiter is one way, if you get the right flux, right? And you can have different fluxes for different users, you know, different doses for different levels of dependence, for example. Yeah. But I think that's sort of what we're driving at, is trying to figure out like, is there a there there? And the FDA thinks it's something that they would be interested in regulating potentially. So yeah. that's sort of why we're pushing on it. It reminds me of like having different nicotine patch dosages and things like that available for exactly. you know, recommended yep. for different user populations. Yep. So right I'm just going to jump in just because we're, uh, I, I want to make sure we have time to get through the rest of your talk, Andrew. I'll ask two quick questions. Feel free to give quick responses. Um, so this one is uh, from Shang. Uh, she asks um, about uh, 
the willingness to pay and switching point, she thinks might depend a lot on participants' income and expenditures. And uh, the question is whether you uh, use a fixed budget in your experiment and because income varies a lot, how sort of your, um, your approaches might uh, inform uh, disparities or behavioral differences by SES, socioeconomic status. Yeah, that's a great point, Steve. Thank you. Yes, we, we tend to have, um, you know, oftentimes, you know, lower income populations generally that come into our studies. Um, you know, we haven't seen a lot of association between income and 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 their sort of weekly spending and their and their sort of willingness to pay or crossover point. Um, however, I'm going to talk about some studies that are coming up where we give people a study budget based on their own spending and let them go to town in a, in a, in a market. Um, so, but yeah, that that's come up a few times. We haven't really seen a lot of evidence of that, although we are in our current clinical trial, um, stratifying our recruitment by above and below FPL, just to sort of get at sort of, and, and then look at sort of where we, and then we're gonna look at whether we see differential responding by FPL status. So great, great question. Great, so then uh, Cheryl Olson in the q and asked a pair of questions that I'll, I'll um, combine uh, related to uh, abuse liability. And so whether you can clarify whether all e-cigarette use is sort of considered, all e-cigarette use is considered abuse or sort of uh, liability of abuse um, because your measures don't seem to address impaired functioning or adverse effects, which might be uh, lower with e-cigarettes. And so how, how you sort of think about these, your mm -hmm. measures ca capturing uh, abuse liability. And then also she asks about um, how you distinguish sort of appeal for a product versus abuse liability. And I would add to this that, you know, you, you know, if somebody has a belief that using e-cigarettes is going to uh, provide some benefits that maybe that would, they'd be willing to pay more for that. And so it might not be yep. all about abuse liability. It could be about, about other demand coming from other sort of uh, dimensions. Absolutely, absolutely. I'm gonna take this real quick, uh, but um, I think that, um, so abuse liability, regardless of the drug of, of abuse, right, is really about sort of what's the potential for, for um, uh, reinforcement and 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 also consequences, right? The, the, so the, the two can be two separate things, um, and and we're really interested. Why we why we care about ends abuse liability is we really want to know, like for example, uh, uh, cigarettes and ends, right? We want an ends product. If we if 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 the regulatory goal from a public health standpoint is to shift people from cigarettes to ends, okay, let's just say that is the regulatory goal. Then we're going to want to know want to know which ends has a high enough abuse liability to entice a smoker to switch to it without being so high that it has uh, it has excessive adverse consequences. So I, and I sort of want to frame sort of how we're thinking about this. And part of it comes from a harm reduction perspective, not always, right? Um, but, uh, you know, because you can certainly think of the other way around with like abuse liability and kids and using ends, right? And you'd want the lowest abuse liability ends out there. You want a zero, right? So I'm gonna, yeah, so that that's a really fair point. Um, but, you know, I think we are trying to get at a lot of times lining up abuse liability, understanding abuse liability for different products or different versions of a given product to understand where people are gonna move to when one product goes away or is harder to get through taxes or some other regulation, all right? Um, great, great question. Um, yeah, there's other questions, uh, but we'll come to them at the end if there's time. Uh, please feel free to continue, and uh, our audience can put their question, further questions into the chat of the Q and A. All right, so we'll talk. Thanks, Justin, um, and thank you all for the engagement. I really enjoyed this um, and all the questions in the chat. Um, all right, so we're going to talk. Spend the last few minutes talking about some extensions and, re and refinements to our methods. Um, so first of all, these hypothetical purchase tasks, um, does the price frame of the ends choice matter, right? Is it, is it puffs or is it milliliters of liquid? It sort of depends on what kind of user you are. So we tried this out. We, we sort of gave people uh, both. Uh, and it turns out there's, they're really highly correlated. Um, uh, the, the, um, whether you're using, asking people to purchase puffs or milliliters of liquid. Um, and then we also looked at, you know, which of these is correlated with dependence for, for ends. And it turns out again, like this sort of, sort of weird concept to economists, but not so weird to like behavioral psychologists. It's sort of like ability to consume a drug when it's free, there's no constraints on it. Um, seems to be, uh, you know, highly correlated with uh, dependence, at least in the case of ends. So 
So prices, price frames don't really matter. Pick the one that's sort of most relevant to your users. If you've got, you know, tank people, maybe mills, if you've got, you know, closed, you know, system uh, pups, right? Um, so, and then a little more work on the cross product purchase task. So this is where we're, you know, uh, we're recruiting uh, dual users and exclusive ends users. And then we're asking them, we're increasing the price of their ends. And they're asking them how much they would, how much of their ends and a cigarette they would buy if both are available to them, right? We're fixing the price of the cigarette and we're increasing the price of the ends. We really want to know if you tax ends, what's going to happen among ends users and dual users. And this is sort of relevant to some of Mike's work. Um, you know, what will happen um, with this in the cigarette market? Um, and what's interesting here is we look at ends and dual users separately. Look at their cross price elasticity. They're identical, but the profile is very different. So we had to unpack this, right? So you have ends users, exclusive and duals, both have sort of this positive cross price elasticity, which you'd expect, but the profile of that curve looks very different. And so what we found is that, um, you know, most dual users would still buy uh, cigarettes, even if ends are free. They, 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 have, they have strong preferences for a cigarette, but they're dual users. Um, people who dual used uh, both products simultaneously, um, uh, you know, they, they purchased, people who dual used purchased ends and cigarettes simultaneously in about one third of the ends prices, right? And so uh, that's sort of, the, this figure on the right is the span of ends prices over which people demanded cigarettes. You can see the blue are all the dual users. They have a lot more span of ends prices they're willing to buy cigarettes at, right? Um, and so for those most at risk of dual use, we see that, you know, we, we estimated that raising the price of ends to be about three to four times the price of cigarettes would promote complete substitution from ends to cigarettes among dual users, right? And so what we're thinking is that ends taxes may not steer people who exclusively use ends towards cigarette use necessarily, but will definitely prompt dual users to completely substitute, um, uh, at least some of them. So um, that paper is coming out uh, very shortly as well. This is my student's F30 that just got funded for NIDA. It's an ICO study. So it's looking at recruiting menthol cigarette smokers and, and um, it's a and they're, they bring them into the lab. They get either a menthol HTP ICOS condition or tobacco uh, condition. Um, if we have more time at the end, I'll tell you all the crazy stories that we have with trying to get this product as the FTC was shutting down availability, but uh, anyway, we have it, we have lots of it. Um, so uh, he's got participants coming in, they screen, they, they, um, they do it, uh, um, they, they, are, they also get text about their use. Um, um, they have a one week own brand use and a one week uh, ICOS use, right? And they're asked to sort of switch over to their ICOS during that second week. And uh, when they come into the lab, they're, um, they're abstinent, they, we, you know, you can see that they, they do, we do a blood draw, they have a 10 puff directed bout, we do another blood draw, they, and then they do an experimental tobacco marketplace. We're gonna measure nicotine delivery and menthol delivery in their blood after in both the ICOS and the, the, the menthol cigarette conditions, you know, weeks, right? So we're sort of like, what's the nicotine boost and what's the menthol boost in the HTP, menthol HTP versus menthol cigarette, right? And also there's menthol in regular cigarettes or regular HTPs probably. So what's, what's in there as well. And um, the abuse liability measures we're using are experimental tobacco marketplaces. They're an extension of this cross product task where now instead of just two products, you have a whole marketplace of products to ask that to purchase from here, speaking to see directly, people do have a budget and that budget's based on their own spending from the prior week or two. And, uh, you know, people can buy whatever they want to buy until their budget runs out. Um, and then those choices can be reinforced. We're not reinforcing it in this study because we're, we're providing uh, ICOs to people in the second week. So we don't want to be providing people with other things while they're using their ICOs. So, but typically these choices are reinforced as well. Um, this uh, I'll talk about two more studies real quick uh, that I'm super excited about. This is our clinical trial that's going on right now. We've got two people in the lab here for it. It's funded by FDA and NIDA, predicting the effects of ENDS flavor regulation on tobacco use behavior, toxicity, and abuse liability among African-American menthol smokers. 
It's a three arm, six week parallel group RCT among uh, African-American black people who smoke menthol cigarettes with a 30 day follow up. Uh, and so uh, people are randomized to a menthol or tobacco dual condition, so They can choose whether they want menthol and tobacco or how many of each they want. So we're, we're simulating markets, right? Um, so a market where both of these are available, a market where only tobacco jewel is available and a market where only unflavored jewel, which we had to make, uh, um, is available. And um, we, we have several aims, but the abuse liability aim is really looking at sort of um, our, you know, if we have menthol ends available, are our black menthol smokers more likely to substitute to an end than if we don't have it available, all right? Um, so this is sort of what it looks like. We have, um, you know, uh, EMA, they're getting every day about their, their own brand use for six weeks and, and, our in, and their end use for six weeks or, or while they're in the study. Um, we're collecting uh, carbon monoxide. We're collecting um, cotinine from the urine and NAL, which is a marker of, of uh, carcinogens from cigarettes only. And then we're measuring propylene glycol to see if they're actually using the ends. Um, so measure that in your urine. And then we're doing these purchase tasks. We've randomized 17 already, um, about seven to the you know tobacco plus menthol condition, five to the tobacco and five to the unflavored condition so far. Um, and our goal is to randomize uh, 210 over the next year and a half. The last study I'll talk about is um, really interested in sort of like informing the FDA about FDA authorized ends. As you guys know, there's several FDA authorized ends out there now. Um, and they all vary in their flux, and they're also all tobacco flavored. So we're gonna um, uh, look at sort of the extent to which, um, you know, the abuse liability for, for these products, how's that map on to, um, to people's own brand cigarettes? And, um, and, you know, also we're gonna in introduce a menthol version of each of these products and see how much uh, higher is the abuse liability of, of menthol in these products to, to regular tobacco flavor. So it's a five condition study or four condition study. Um, and we're gonna launch that in January. So right after we get back from the holidays. Um, and so, and we're sort of gonna move on from here to, to start thinking about how to write, I wanna write a series of papers over the next few years with, with our team, Caroline and others about sort of like, what are we learning about incorporating sort of as someone said in the comment that Justin related, um, Laura Olson, I think, um, sort of like, how do these pieces fit together, right? And, and I think we need to think about that a lot more. And, and, and I wanna do that through sort of these longer format articles. So um, that I wanna hopefully have us all right. And uh, anyway, come back and maybe talk about that in a couple of years. So um, I'm gonna stop. I've talked a lot and I wanna hear what y'all think. Great, thank you so much. Uh, I think I will turn it again over to Tracy Smith to see if she has, uh, give her first shot at questions. Great, it's so exciting to hear about everything you've got going on. I think the study thinking about the authorized products is especially important because sometimes we talk about how, you know, those are not the most popular. And so understanding, you know, the degree to which they differ in their abuse liability, I think is really impactful. And there may be room in there to think about um, the couple of few products that are still pending, you mentioned menthol for, you know, a lot of those applications are pending. And then I know like the Alto is still pending. I don't know how imminent that decision is, but um, things like that, that might be useful to include as well. I'm sure you guys are already overloaded with um, projects. But um, one thing I thought about as you were presenting, you know, the the work that you've done thinking about um, transitioning substitution of cigarettes for ends among ends users, um, which I, I do think is uh, really important to think about how that differs for dual users and exclusive ends users. Um, and I'm sure you've already thought about, it's also a great opportunity to ask about um, potential ends regulations and the potential for exclusive ends users to be transitioning back to cigarettes. So things like ends flavor regulations or the flux um, regulations that you mentioned and like whether those would have an impact on people who are already ends users potentially transitioning back. And I'm wondering if, you, if that's something that you're planning to investigate. That is a great suggestion. Um, Mm, I don't know. I mean, so actually, you know, one one thing in this flux study I was talking about, um, not so. There's two two groups that are doing this work, and here at VCU that are part of our center, myself and Caroline, and then Paul Meisenberg and Alison Breland. 
So we have sort of these sister projects. In their study, they actually have a cigarette challenge at the end where they, they sort of let people uh, pick up a cigarette and smoke it if they want after trying this, these different box conditions. But, um, you know, I think you're absolutely right that it's, it's um, you know, that's what's so hard about these products, right? So you have all these different product features that uh, are regulatory targets that also influence demand, right? And so it's hard to pin them all down, but you know, you're right that, um, you know, we have to think about flux uh, flavors and salts and all those things when we're thinking about sort of like what, uh, how, what are the potential unintended consequences of ends regulations? You know, it's one thing it was just price policy, but you know, when you move beyond price policy, it, it could be more complicated, right? I think that's your yeah. point. Yeah. Um, and you have such great examples of how um, those types of regulations might impact switching already. And so this is kind of the, the opposite pathway of that potential switching back, um, assuming that those people are former smokers, which some of them are and some of them presumably are. Right. Um, yeah. yeah. So um, I'll ask, so you had the figure at the end, the kind of conceptual diagram, thinking about these different um, conceptual targets and how they might relate to uh, behavior. Yeah. Um, and I'm wondering, you know, specifically even in the um, category of reinforcing effects where you've got choice procedures, you've showed us so many examples of different types of choice procedures and how in some cases, you know, the the outcomes or the take home message might differ between those different choice procedures, multiple choice procedure versus a progressive ratio task. And I'm just wondering if you have thoughts about the, about, you know, how the um, regulatory impact should be interpreted when the results differ across these, these measures that in theory kind of are the same outcome or, or look at this. Are measuring the same construct, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So this is something we're, we're I'm gonna be honest with you, we're still struggling with a little bit, right? So I think at first, when we first started doing this work and we got our center funded uh, the second time around and we sort of were gonna go all in on abuse liability. Carolyn and I were just like, let's just chuck all of these measures into, into our studies. And you're right. So uh, we don't, they don't always line up. Um, and so where we're moving more towards is like, we're, 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 I mean, becoming increasingly confident with hypothetical purchase tasks, uh, becoming increasingly confident with, we're gonna start, we're using the experimental tobacco marketplace more. Um, the choice procedures, particularly the progressive ratio task procedure is a little tricky because you worry about satiation, right? So people are working for a dose and when they get that dose, they might stop working or they might stop working because they don't like it. And it's hard to disentangle that right now with the way we've got the PRT set up. So we're working on that um, for sure. I think that's tricky. Um, the MCP should in theory line up pretty well with the hypothetical purchase task and it sort of does. I feel like the purchase task because you have more of a range to get responses over, uh, you, get, um, a, you get more of a distribution and it's a little bit easier to work with analytically than getting sort of one, one, one data point. Um, and, and I think it, it maps on a little bit more. It's better to like what we think about um, in, in sort of cla neoclassical economics of demand. So we've actually stopped using the multiple choice procedure uh, in our work. Yeah, interesting. Yeah. Justin, do you want, sure. I know we're almost out of time, so I don't want to overstep. Uh, so we have time. If you have one more question, you're welcome to ask it. Otherwise, um, we can. Moved yeah, so you mentioned, well, you um, you mentioned how the progressive ratio task can be challenging, but you also said kind of towards the beginning that you guys have, are now thinking about um, a progressive ratios where there's multiple products that you could be responding for. I think that was something you mentioned at the beginning. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm, and I'm wondering mm -hmm. kind of, you know, how, um, how you're using that and um, what you think the, that adds to the picture. Yeah, so so we started that we used that um, in one study, our um, our our flux study, um, and we actually that study still ongoing. We haven't analyzed the the cross data too much yet. We have started looking at it, um, and it's just another way of trying to look at like we're trying to try to dig into more to our because when you have we have we had a good amount of freedom to think about methods and trying to uh, use some of these use some of these tasks in the lab where we've had maybe been applied before. And so, so we programmed one up and we used it and, and um, we're still trying to figure out how useful it is. Uh, we're currently not using it in, in, our, in our study that we're, we're gonna launch in January or in our clinical trial uh, because we just don't know enough about you know, you know, how, how predictive it is yet. So um, 
I can come back and tell you maybe in like six months and we get a better chance to okay. wrap our heads around it. But yeah. Yeah, it's interesting. I think that's a, a neat idea. It probably has a lot of applications that maybe aren't addressed by some of the other tasks. Yeah. Thanks, Tracy. So I will just also, I, I won't even ask for your reply on this, Andrew, but maybe just for further consideration, Mike Pesco had asked a question that is dovetails on something Tracy had mentioned about uh, related to nicotine concentration, uh, how, you know, would it be a reasonable strategy to incentivize uh, use of higher uh, nicotine concentration e-cigarettes if it um, reduces harm and, you know, maybe, uh, that would be a, a preferable situation. So again, getting to this idea of abuse liability. So something for, uh, for further consideration. I think though, I will turn it over to Si Shang to take us out. So thanks again. Thank you. Uh, we are out of time. Thank you to our presenter, moderator and discussant. Finally, thank you to the audience of 160 people for your participation. Have a top notch weekend. Thank you everyone.